as we continue the study of this book. And we uh, have been doing a little sort of uh, look forward throughout the book, even though we're going to take our time throughout the several chapters. And what we are doing is, for the last few Sundays, we're looking at what we consider to be an organizing motif in the book of Revelation, an organizing theme. It's a theme that uh, lends to the book um, a powerful coherence, structurally, harmony, all the way through. What is that theme? It's the theme of the heavenly tabernacle. The heavenly tabernacle. Now, we said that this is not just a theme of the book of Revelation, but it is a theme of, that runs through the Bible. That it was God's intention, it's been God's intention from the beginning to reveal and to cover the earth with His heavenly tabernacle, with His visible presence, together with the angelic hosts. So, what is the heavenly tabernacle? We have said it is the dwelling place of God with men in the final, perfected, blessed state. So, that is God's intention with salvation. It is to dwell with men. That is the blessing of men. We ask, what, what is the, the blessing of men? What is the blessing of humanity? What are we looking forward to as believers, as Christians, to dwell with God forever and ever and to enjoy Him forever? That is the hope of the Christian. This world is passing and its desires. But the hope of the Christian through the will of God in Christ is to dwell with God forever and ever in that final state of perfection, of consummation, of blessed immortality. So, what we have been doing the last few Sundays is to look at the book of Revelation and to discern its structure. And to see then, through this structure, how the theme of the heavenly tabernacle appears again and again and again all the way till final revelation, glory, and splendor at the end of the book. And then we said to recap and maybe get you caught up, is that the book of Revelation is made up of several visions. Several visions. These visions, then we said, to help understand a little bit more, it's like the Gospels. We know that there are four Gospels in the Bible, right? Each one of those four Gospels recounts the same story, does it not? But they're not the same, are they? They're different Gospels, the same story, the same events, the same content, content, but from a different perspective. Each one of the Gospel authors provides a view from their own perspective. So in Revelation, something similar is happening. Each one of these visions, we could say it's a mini apocalypse, stands on its own recounting the events, but each from a different camera angle or perspective, and each adding, enriching, and intensifying the message that God wants to share. What are these visions? This is what we have shared. And this structure may vary according to the scholars, the Bible teachers, but uh, even though there may be some variations, it is usually organized around this structure. The visions are, number one, the seven churches. The vision of the seven churches. What do we have at the end of the vision of the seven churches? We have the revelation of the heavenly tabernacle. 
At the end of chapter 3, there is an invitation to come and dine with God and to enter His temple. And then chapters 4 and 5, the glorious vision of Christ as the Lamb that has overcome, seated at the right hand of God, the 24 elders representing the church together with the angelic hosts worshiping the Lamb. So that is a mini-apocalypse. That is, so to speak, a gospel. In other words, it recounts from one perspective the story that God wants to share in Revelation. What is that story? The victory of the Lamb. The triumph of Christ together with His saints and our reigning with Christ over the enemies. We said that is the, the content, the message of the book of Revelation and its purpose. The purpose is to speak to a church that will encounter growing and increasing tribulation, persecution, trials, and to help them understand that even though things down here may get really, really tough and hard, here is the vision of what has already taken place spiritually speaking. The, lion, the, the lamb has conquered, he has triumphed, and we are reigning with him. And it's only a matter of time before final consummation and the enemies are put under his feet. But that victory has already been sealed. That is the message of Revelation. Okay, that is what we are looking for, ought to be looking for, in the book of Revelation, first vision, the seven churches, second, the seals, the seven seals. After the message to the church, notice that's the first thing that God does in the book of Revelation is address the church. Now he opens up the seals, which are God's judgments over humanity. Judgments that he has been in this final age final times, final days, ever since after the first coming of Christ. He is uh, unleashing over the world to see if the world will humble themselves, will repent, and turn to Him. So those are the seven seals. They're sort of general judgments. It's a vision that ends, we saw also, with the uh, we haven't seen it yet, but we, we will see it ends with the culmination of the martyrs and the church triumphant being redeemed out of tribulation. And what do we have at the end of the seven seals again? We have the end, the heavenly tabernacle. That's Revelation 7, 9 through 12, 15 through 17. What is the next vision, third vi uh, series of... of um, of visions, the trumpets. So the churches, the seals, and the trumpets. We have an intensification of God's judgments. God wants to tell His people, I am in control. I am in the throne. I am judging the earth. I am ruling. I am reigning. It may not seem like it from down below from the perspective of what's happening in the world, but I am giving you this revelation, this prophecy for you to understand that I am the omnipotent God who rules. And in the trumpets, we hear again of the judgments of God, intensified and also spiritual judgments over humanity. What do we have at the end of the trumpets? That's Revelation eleven fifteen through 19. Again, the heavenly tabernacle appears. Another mini apocalypse, another rap, another scene that ends. Another gospel, so to speak, comes to an end. So the curtain closes and opens up again. And now we see another vision. And that is the vision of the conflict, the who is who. In Revelation or in the spiritual conflict, we have the enemy on the one hand that is portrayed as Babylon, the beasts, and obviously 
the dragon or Satan versus the redeemed. So that vision uh, is given unto us so that we may understand the spiritual backdrop to what is happening in the world. What do we have at the end of this conflict vision, so to speak? The vision of the heavenly tabernacle again appears. And we're going to see that. What do we have after the conflict? The vision of the bowls. The bowls of wrath. It's that final series of judgments that bring humanity's history to the end. This is where the enemies of God begin to be judged. Now, what we're going to see in Revelation is that God judges the enemies one by one. In other words, He gives you a vision in which Babylon is judged. And the vision ends. It opens up again and He gives you a vision where the beasts are judged. And the curtain drops again. And then finally, He gives you a vision where Satan is judged. And then the end. Now, that does not mean that these three are judged separately. Or that you could have the dragon without the beasts. Or the beasts without Babylon. What Revelation is doing is, he's, it's give, God is giving you in separate acts, from different camera angles, the judgment of God's enemies. So notice it's not a chronological sequence that we have in the book of Revelation. It is more a, a, a theater movie-like uh, presentation in which in each one of the chapters or the episodes or the acts, the same events are recounted with different emphases, with different perspectives. So after the bowls, we have the victory over the enemies and then final judgment. So those are, that is the structure that we have suggested um, following many who have done so. And you're going to see a couple of different variations if you were to go deeper into the subject. So with that in mind, we have already seen the seven churches and the vision of the tabernacle at the end. We have seen the seals and the vision of the tabernacle at the end. Let's take a look at the trumpets. And I think we also saw that, but we're going to pick it up here to continue advancing. Go to chapter 11 of Revelation. In chapter 11, beginning in verse 15. So here at the end, where the seventh trumpet is going to be sounded, we come to an end of a mini apocalypse, an end of a vision. And here's what the word says, beginning in verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. So that is a message that we hear in Revelation. The Lord reigns. The kingdoms of this world are the kingdoms of Christ. And the Lord reigns forever and ever. So when we hear that message, verse 16, the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God. So this is a vision again of that heavenly tabernacle that opens up at the end of the seven trumpets. They are saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. What is God doing here, folks, by giving us this heavenly tabernacle vision at the end of each mini-apocalypse? Is filling your mind and your heart with how we ought to think, to view reality, to view the world and the history of mankind. When the 24 elders worship and the heavenly tabernacle opens up, what God is doing is He's drawing you in to say, 
This is what you must see. When John sees, he's giving us this prophecy for you to see. The response of John at some point of surprise or other point of concern and then of jubilant joy and worship and praise with the 24 elders and the angels, this is the response that God wants to impress upon you. During our pilgrimage, during our time in this earth, throughout the different seasons of our lives. So if we take this one, for example, this revelation at the end of the seven trumpets of the heavenly tabernacle, how does God want you to think about reality right now? Christ is reigning. The kingdoms of the world belong to Christ. He has overcome. You have taken great power and reign. The nations were angry. Yes, the nations are angry. Because the nations here uh, depict the nations that are in rebellion against God. The nations that reject Christ, the revelation of the gospel. The revelations that rise up against God's anointed. So he wants you to look at the world and understand what is happening. What is happening is not just that there are turf uh, conflicts and local and regional wars and this and that, but that the nations are being agitated by a spiritual power that is called the old serpent. And he is stirring them up against the Lord's anointed, and against God's people that they rage, and their rage is ultimately directed against God, against Christ, and against God's people, His bride, the church, the redeemed of the Lord. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. And God wants you to know, church, as you go through your pilgrimage, that God is a God of wrath that will judge the enemies. And this is not a message that many people like. But it's interesting. We live in a world today where people want justice, right? They, they talk about justice a whole lot. And they, they lament the lack of justice. See, when you hear about God's wrath, what you should understand, understand is that God's wrath has to do with justice, with the execution of perfect justice. The way that God wants you to think about wrath, His wrath, and His justice is that that perfect justice that anybody would want in a perfect world will be executed and carried out in God's judgments. There is coming a day of perfect justice and it comes from the Lord Almighty because he is a just judge and avenger of evil that's the way that God would have you think about the day of wrath about the day of judgment the nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged there's going to be a day of judgment. The Bible says it is appointed for men to die and then the judgment. This is a sobering thought. One of the lies of the culture, one of the lies of the nations, as you will see the nations as we advance in Revelation, they socialize in a city. What city is that? Is it Miami? <laughs> is it, I don't know. Paris. <laughs> it's called Babylon in Revelation. It's here or there, and it's everywhere. It's called Babylon, hearkening back to the old city of Babylon where Neb Nebuchadnezzar sat as the epitome of the pride of men, as the epitome of the self center self-exalting, self-glorifying endeavors of man contrary to God. 
and God's will and God's plan. So the nations, the nations were angry, and they are coming together. They're coming together as Babylon. They're socializing into a world system that will have, that has a set of ideas, of beliefs, of philosophy, even of religion that is a counterfeit, that is contrary to God and His Christ and the gospel and God's people. But how does God want you to think about this? He wants you to know that they shall be judged. That the enemies of God, that the enemies of righteousness, that the enemies of holiness, that the enemies of true love, that the enemies who are the true haters will be judged. And perfect justice shall be executed. The time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints. A time of reward is coming. How else does God want you to think throughout your stay in this earth? That your reward is not here. Understand that. Because there is a type of Christianity that would have you believe that if you become a Christian, you will either stop suffering or have your best life now. Nothing could be farther from the biblical idea of a Christian life. That lie is bought by those who are ignorant of the Word of God or those who close their eyes and their hearts to the biblical revelation of the Christian faith and the Christian life. But increasingly more so, if you are not already, you will feel the rejection of Babylon. If you're a believer, you will feel the rejection of Babylon. If you're a believer standing with Christ for Him, and if you want to follow Him, you're going to feel at best the rejection of a world that is contrary to your faith. I ask you if you have begun to feel that. It doesn't matter how nice we try to be. And we want to be nice. We don't want to be obnoxious. We, don't want, to, we want to be nice to people. We want to be compassionate. We want to be merciful. We want to be tolerant. <laughs> we want to be embracing. We want to be loving but we also want to stand with truth, right? And the moment you stand with truth, Babylon will hate you. Babylon not only will hate you, but Babylon will persecute you. Not only will Babylon persecute you, but Babylon will ultimately kill you. That is not something in the future to happen, even though it is a foreign and a strange concept to us in America. But that has been going on for centuries throughout the world. The Babylonian system, the socialization of the nations enraged against God and His Lord Christ and His people had been at war with the body of Christ and with the church and persecuting and killing and trying to destroy and stamp out the name of Christ. But... After we have suffered a little, the Bible says, we shall inherit our reward. See, when these times of tribulations come our way, this is where our, truly our faith is tested. As long as everything is sailing smoothly, right? Everything is just going fine. Even if Christianity is popular in our little circles, we're, we're fine. <laughs> Because we're sort of drawing some temporal rewards from it. But the moment everything is at stake, and the only thing that you hold on to is eternal rewards and your heavenly inheritance, the question then is, will you stand? Will we stand? If we are filled with this vision, if we keep the words of this prophet, that's, that's how we keep the book of Revelation, or the 
prophecy of revelation. We keep it by being filled with its visions, by being absorbed into this mindset, by having this perspective and holding on to Christ, who is the substance and the center of this revelation. So what happens then at the end here of the trumpets? We are seeing, right, we're seeing the heavenly vision and then verse 19, then the temple of God was opened in heaven. Notice, the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. So once again, we have a vision at the end, a revelation at the end of this vision of the seven trumpets of this mini apocalypse, another gospel, so to speak, of the end, a final triumph a final judgment of the victory of the Lamb. And immediately then there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. And that is how the curtain drops on this scene, on this vision of the seven trumpets, the end. But it's going to start again in another series of visions. And what do we have after the trumpets? We have the vision of the conflict. So the next couple of chapters, chapters 12, 13, on to 14, we have the spiritual conflict, the backdrop. We have the battle, the battle in the heavenly of Christ with Satan. Because of Christ's victory, Satan being thrown out of heaven, because of Christ's victory on the cross, Satan no longer is able to bring accusation before the heavenly court. That's what that means. It's no longer to hold some, any legal rights before the heavenly court. By the way, we hear all this nonsense today of legal rights that demons have and that needs to be canceled and such. Nonsense. Demons and Satan no longer have any legal rights over the believer. The legal rights were taken away, were canceled, because the debt, Colossians chapter 2, was canceled. The handwriting of requirements that was against us was nailed on the cross. The only power that Satan has is the one that we give him. As we allow him, as we rather than submit to God, run with Babylon and get intoxicated with Babylon and compromise with Babylon, thus we are affected by Satan and his demons. The Lord rebuke them. But as far as legal rights, they have none over you. Satan has got nothing on you because the blood of the Ark of the Covenant has been shed for you and it covers you. You belong to Christ. You have been sealed with the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God indwells you. Satan cannot indwell you. Oh, can Satan affect you? For sure. Can it feel as if you are, and this is where I think a great sector of modern Christianity is going wrong by delivering Christians and delivering Christians from demons. Listen, Christians were already delivered from demonic possession and demonic rights. And Satan afflict you, affect you, shake you up in deep ways. Yes, he can. Can he deceive you into thinking that he's inside of you, that he's controlling you, that you belong to him? He can, he's going to try to deceive you. <clears throat> but greater is he that is in us than he who is in the world. We are indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. We are possessed by the Holy Spirit of God. We belong to Christ. 
We had the rights of adoption, the rights of children. Any past curses, anything from the past, when we come to Christ, it is canceled. We are set free. If anyone comes to Christ, if anyone believes in Him, if anyone has the Son, He is free indeed. So you have this conflict here because the Lord, and we're going to come back to it again, but we're sort of going in this fast pace, looking at this motif of the heavenly tabernacle after each vision that has been our approach the last few Sundays, we have this spiritual conflict. And the spiritual conflict or battle is one that Christ won. Christ won. Understand that. You do not have to win a spiritual conflict. Okay? Christ already won it for you. All you have to do is stand. You notice that's what Christians are called to do? Christians are called to stand. Stand where? In Christ. Because the battle has already been won for you. You could not even stand a chance against the least of demons, <laughs> let alone Satan. You could not be put up to fight against them. So this, another nonsensical notion of part of today's Christianity is that we do battle against demons, that we go into spiritual conflict against them and we overcome them. No, saint. That's a losing proposition. The battle has been won by our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Yeah. And we are clothed in Him. The, the armor of the Christian that we hear in Ephesians is basically our standing in Christ. It's how we stand. It's the resources and the means of grace and the blessedness that is ours as we stand in Christ daily. So we have the spiritual conflict we have Satan kicked out of heaven. We have the woman, the church persecuted. We have the beast rising and manifesting. The one from the sea, the one from the earth. One, and we're going to get to the beasts. Antichrist and the false prophet. So this, this is the spiritual vision of the spiritual conflict. The who's who? Then we come to the redeemed of chapter 14. And what do we have then after this vision? Let's go to chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, and then jump over to 15. <clears throat> In other words, after this vision, after the spiritual conflict is, is given, God wants you to know that you reign, that you're victorious, even though the enemies are impressive, okay? But yeah, look at this. Revelation 14, beginning in verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, <laughs> and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps, they sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. So we have the vision again of the heavenly tabernacle. And again, the 144,000 appear. I said, who are the 144,000? Well, a little interpretation, a, a wooden cross, literal interpretation of these causes at JWs to think that only 144,000 will go to heaven, right? Or it causes, unfortunately, others among Christians that there is some sort of a selected group or that there are just certain Jews that will do that. But Revelation uh, dissipates those notions. We have already seen the 144,000, have we not? Right? We already saw that vision. 
and we saw the depiction of tribes. And then we saw that not only of those tribes, um, it, it's not to be taken in a literal sense. There, it, there are even some tribes missing there. But the point of Revelation is that God is going to say both out of Jews and out of Gentiles, 12 plus 12 plus 1,000 indicates the completion of all of God's people from the Old and from the New Testament times. The bride of Christ, the multitude that no one can number from every tribe, tongue, and nation and tribe. So we have them here. These are the ones, verse 4, who were not defiled with women for their virgins. In what sense? In a spiritual sense. Because as we're going to see, Babylon is depicted as a harlot. What, what happens in Babylon? Harlotry. Fornication of a spiritual kind. We'll have more to say on that. We'll have much more to say in that. So these are virgins. In what sense? Do you notice the language of Revelation, the symbolic language of Revelation? We have to read the symbols. We have to gain wisdom. We have to understand what God is saying here. If, if the 144,000 are virgins because they never married, well, where is that in the rest of the Scripture? <laughs> See, one of the principles of understanding Scripture is that we interpret Scripture with Scripture. And the harder passages in light of more clear passages, right? Nowhere in the Word of God is marriage not somehow, you know, put in a bad light. On the contrary, it is, it is, a, it is a vocation in which we ought to honor and to serve our spouses, right? And we can live out our Christian lives in it. But what's being signified here is that these are the redeemed of the Lord, the ones that have been faithful, the ones that have not defiled themselves in Babylon. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. These are the ones that confess the name of Christ. These are the ones that do not lie. What does the psalmist say? I did not lie, but I confess my sin before you. The rest of mankind and Babylon, they're liars. Who's a liar? He who does not confess that he is a liar. <laughs> that he has lied. <laughs> That's a good sometimes rule to follow. Who's a hypocrite? He who does not confess his hypocrisy. Who's a fornicator? He who does not confess his fornication. Because if you confess your sins, if you repent of your sins, if you confess your sins, if you live before God in faith and repentance, confessing your sins, not lying about it, not lying about it, not becoming defensive about them, not justifying your sins and justifying yourselves, but in brokenness and humility, confessing your sins before God and turning to Christ, then, dear child, your sins are forgiven. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And you have a part in the 144,000 in the redeemed so who are these? Uh, notice, go to chapter 15. Chapter 15, here at the end of the conflict, at the end of this conflict, because this vision here shows not only the enemy, but it also shows the redeemed. It shows the redeemed. It shows the victory. It shows the battle. It comes to the end. Notice again in this mini apocalypse of this conflict, you come to the end here in chapter 14. There's a reaping, a reaping of the earth's harvest. There is a separation of the godly and the ungodly. And then the heavenly tabernacle once again appears. Chapter 15, as a prelude 
to the next series of visions or intensifying judgments. Chapter 15, then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who had the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. So notice how Revelation intensifies the nature, the understanding of the conflict. Now it begins to speak in terms that we have been victorious over the beast, over the mark of the beast, over Babylon, over the enemy. We stand on this sea of glass before the throne of God. It's a vision of the heavenly tabernacle and the triumphant saints with Christ. And what are we doing there? Verses, verse 3, they sing the song of Moses. There's a lot of singing in Revelation. Because it's a book of victory. They sing the song of Moses, a servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. Notice the vision of the tabernacle again. This is how God would have you think through your time of pilgrimage. It is given for us. This is not given for a group of Christians during some sort of last three and a half years, seven years, or however some notions which we believe mistaken abound. This is given for you today. This is given for saints in the Middle Ages. This is given for the saints in the first century. This is how you are to think. He is the king of the saints he is to be feared and to be glorified. All nations are the kingdoms of our Christ. Your judgments have been manifested. Verse 5, after these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. You see it again? You see this motif of the temple? of the heavenly tabernacle, now open right before the next series of visions, which will be the bowls and the final judgments of the enemy. The temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And what was in the temple? Notice that what is used here is Old Testament language, the Ark of the Covenant, the testimony. It was the presence of God. It was the glory of God, but it was the glory of God through the blood of the sacrifice that was shed on the altar on the mercy seat. That's why revelation is the revelation of Christ, because it opens the temple, meaning access to the very presence of God, the hope of dwelling with God, and it reminds you that this blessing is yours through the blood of the everlasting covenant. What is that covenant? The covenant of grace. That you are there, that you stand before the throne, not on your own account, not on your own deserts, not on your own claim, not because of what you have done, but because of the mercy seat, but because of the shed blood of the Lamb. And this is given unto us because we're going to go through tribulation and through heartache and through temptations and through ups and downs. And the way that God wants you to think is, I have been purchased, I am acquired of the Lord, not through my works, but through the shed blood of the Lamb. I belong to Him. Christ is mine. I am His now and forevermore. And one day, I am going to stand before his throne. 
So this is what God is doing with Revelation. He's opening up that vision of your everlasting final hope. Mark that. Because we may need it. We may have finished Revelation. By God's grace, we'll continue to proclaim the gospel of Christ in every page of Scripture. But one day, these lessons and this message is going to come in very handy. And it may be that you find yourself alone in Babylon. Assailed. Attacked. Tempted. Maybe even fallen. What's going to lift you up? How are you going to be restored? What's going to help you get back on your feet? The revelation and the vision of the heavenly tabernacle. The glories and the splendor of the heavenly Jerusalem. And the beauty and the love and the mercy of the Lamb, your God, for you. The peace of God be with you, church. Amen. We're dismissed.